So just a couple of words about Sarah, um, especially these days with energy, I think everyone uh, is, is eager to, to hear. Um, Sarah is, is pushing the envelope on decentralized energy markets, peer-to-peer -peer trading and grid balancing, uh, secured by smart contracts and blockchain technology. Uh, before joining Grid Singularity, uh, she completed a PhD in electrical engineering. Um, so she's a scientist. Uh, I'm a scientist as well, but a political scientist. So, you know. uh, at North Carolina State University and has previously been with Siemens and Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, we're going to have time for, for questions. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's have fun. I think you should, yeah. I think, should we give her a microphone? Yeah? Do you want a microphone? Lovely. How does this sound? People can hear? OK, great. Great. Uh, yeah. Um, welcome, everybody. And uh, yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, blockchain energy futures and specifically the path to social energy communities. Uh, and this is um, the task and the mission of the company, Grid Singularity, uh, that I'm here today to, to represent. Let's see. What goes the. Ah, there we go. Uh, yes, so to start, I um, have to give a little bit of a background. So uh, what we have been seeing in the energy sector is a move from centralization to decentralization. And uh, the, yeah, there are a lot of reasons for this. You know, traditionally, the way people consume power, there was a centralized power plant that produced power and then distributes that to customers who pay for it. And people don't really think very much about uh, the type of energy they're consuming. They just look at their bill and and it's a very uh, passive relationship. And uh, what we've seen over the past, you know, actually like 10, 15 years is this move towards decentralization uh, because in order to transition the type of energy we use, uh, we see more PVs, uh, solar panels, wind turbines, electric vehicles, uh, smart plugs, so people have smart devices in their house where they can uh, determine the time that maybe their dishwasher runs or their washing machine. And so with these increased um, assets, energy assets, assets, uh, which also are digital, um, then the way that electricity is flowing and being consumed is starting to become more decentralized. Uh, so some people have also termed this the, the Internet of Things, uh, to have all of these energy assets that uh, can suddenly be connected to the Internet. So the way that we've started to think about the grid and how to innovate the grid uh, has changed uh, because when we have these decentralized assets, uh, you know, they should be able to participate in the exchange of energy. Um, if someone puts a solar PV on their rooftop, then you know, they should be able to sell their excess to their neighbor or to the grid. And so this is what the mission of my company has been, to develop um, an energy exchange software that allows people to trade energy. Um, and there's, you know, the benefits here are to the consumer uh, so that they can become an active participant. Um, and we also see this as uh, something that's really important for the future, that you know, people should understand where their energy is coming from and they should be able to participate in the system. And when people are more educated and more active, uh, then they can be incentivized to accelerate the transition even further and you know, to also contribute their own um, thoughts. And the second part is that you know, if we have all of these smaller energy assets, uh, it becomes, very, uh, it becomes a stressful control problem for the engineers and the utilities uh, because previously you know, they can simply um, ask the uh, power plant operators to turn on and off the power plants to keep the grid stable. But if everybody has their own independent assets that are plugged in, uh, suddenly the utility doesn't have control over this anymore. So part of our research and research of many people has been to uh, solve this decentralized control problem and how to actually incentivize these distributed assets or decentralized assets uh, to participate in a way that can further um, stabilize and, and increase the health of the grid. 
So that's kind of a big uh, background. And then maybe to tie this quickly into blockchain. Um, so we're also building this exchange on uh, blockchain technology because naturally uh, blockchain is uh, decentralized. So we see that as an enabling technology to help these exchanges and uh, ways to trade energy uh, come to life. Uh, because uh, blockchain is very transparent and it's um, immutable and it's trustless. So it allows players to interact with each other uh, without having to go through a bureaucratic process with a, a centralized intermediary. So we're building this software um, yeah, in a centralized version and then also a decentralized version um, in blockchain, which we see is uh, the future. Um, some other impacts of blockchain, uh, specifically for, for the energy sector, is we see uh, blockchain being used to develop decentralized identifiers uh, so that if someone buys an asset, they can plug it in, it can get an um, anonymized uh, decentralized identifier, and then it can participate um, in the different products that are there. And part of this is also tracking the type of energy that that asset is creating. So if it's creating renewable energy, uh, people may be willing to pay more or to pay extra attention to the type of energy uh, this is. Um, so this is also really important for, for tracking our progress as well into becoming more renewable. You know, how many assets are actually producing renewable energy? When was this produced? You know, who consumed it? Um, these kinds of questions. So, yeah, this is our, our vision of the future energy system and how we are actually building this into a product is we are focusing on energy communities. And so we see uh, energy communities as usually um, maybe 20 to 30 households that have come together and said, okay, we're a community, maybe together we bought um, a wind turbine or we have PV and so we want to um, engage in the energy industry and do our part to become renewable and to understand you know, what kind of energy we're using. So um, yeah, we're creating um, a software for these communities to do research and to um, also uh, study you know, what it would look like if they did peer-to-peer -peer energy trading in, in their community. And part of this is um, what we call energy preferences or degrees of freedom is showing how individual um, consumers can set preferences based on how they want to consume their energy. So do they want to buy renewable energy? Do they want to buy energy from uh, their neighbor or a family member that they know? If they have excess, do they want to donate it to a charity or to a local business? And so all of these possibilities um, we're building into our software to show you know, what our vision of, of the future is. And um, yeah, maybe I'll talk about it a little bit later, but uh, you know, the step to actually implementing this is to prove this technology to regulators. So some of the things that I'm talking about today are not necessarily uh, possible yet in a legal and regulatory um, uh, picture, but that's something that, that we're working on and is, is part of the research uh, that we're doing. Great, so um, yeah, this is kind of an overview of, of what our process looks like. Um, so in terms of building these energy communities, we call them local energy markets, and we want them to be grid aware. So the benefit of having local markets and having um, assets that can trade with each other is that they should trade in a way that benefits the stability of the grid. Um, and maybe many of you are you know, already aware, but the flow of electricity is very fast, it's very spontaneous, so the actual control issues behind keeping the grid stable, keeping the lights on, um, you know, if everyone turns on their TV at the same time to watch um, you know, whatever popular show is on that day or is cooking at the same time for a holiday, you know, how to manage these um, spikes on the grid. And so this can be managed through our local energy markets, um, which help because the prices of energy there directly reflect the supply and demand on the grid. And this has been a big research topic for us in opening the markets um, so that the price of energy actually reflects the supply and demand. Um, and so there's, you know, some research around this, you know, the pricing needs to be uh, predictable for consumers, but at the same time, um, 
in order to keep the prices lower, uh, it has the prices have to actually reflect um, the true cost of electricity at that time. And so maybe what that can look like um, is if there's a, a PV in a neighborhood and it's producing energy during the day, maybe everyone's at work, no one's really consuming this energy, you know, the utility would have to uh, figure out how to deal with this, maybe that's expensive. Um, but if that can be reflected in the price, then maybe a neighbor can store this energy in their um, battery and use it for later and you know we see that battery technology is expensive so in order to you know encourage more people and companies to, to use energy storage uh, there has to be a price benefit for that so that's um, what we're trying to show in our in our energy markets um, yes so this is kind of a picture of how we view the whole landscape. So uh, Grid Singularity has the exchange in the middle and then we have um, APIs connecting to other players. So the two other um, entities that we work, that, that we see connecting to is one is the grid and what's called the um, distribution system operator, so the grid operator. And so they have to uh, connect to our exchanges because they set things called grid fees um, and they manage the grid stability. So they would look at what kind of trades are scheduled, what the energy forecast is, and be able to override something or influence the price based on their models of what the grid stability looks like at a given point in time. And then the other side is more interesting for consumers, and that's actually how do homeowners connect to our exchange. And um, this is where we've uh, integrated a bunch of pieces here. So for example, um, we've looked at third party companies that basically provide consumer apps. So um, in the future, when we think about energy trading, you know, we don't think of someone sitting at home on their phone trying to figure out if they should trade energy or not. We see it as an automated process. So a company that maybe provides an app um, that lets you set your preferences. So you just say, oh, I want to consume renewables. If I can, I would like to trade with my friend. And then based on this, there would be an algorithm that trades on behalf of the homeowner. Uh, so that's done through a prosumer app, uh, which connects to our exchange. And then there's also uh, was the picture there of the Energy Web Switchboard, which um, provides the decentral decentralized ID of, of the various assets. Um, yes, so to sum up, um, we, have, we have these aspects of our market. Um, to further decentralize it, we've also created another module basically for the market clearing mechanism because how the trades are matched is also um, an economic principle. So there's different algorithms that can be used and that might be something that's regulated where certain matching mechanisms are, um, are used in different locations. And um, yes, and then we have the, the influence of the grid operators. Um, and also something that we've envisioned is a, a marketplace of uh, data and algorithms. So it's not really the specialization of our company, but we see also um, more data scientists creating these algorithms and people providing uh, their energy data. Uh, and this is something I think that also connects uh, to blockchain a little bit, the idea of owning and being able to sell your own data. And uh, that's something that can be traced on the blockchain. Um, and so if you have a smart meter and you want to donate some of your data for research or you're a data scientist that's developed an algorithm, uh, you could upload this to our data marketplace and um, uh, yeah, make revenue based on this by um, selling it to other researchers or, or homeowners. Yes, so we've developed kind of this whole spectrum of how we envision the system to look. But at the end of the day, uh, we have a product. You know, how are we actually going to roll this out? And that kind of ties back to what I mentioned in the beginning uh, related to energy communities. So um, yeah, we are targeting uh, specific communities of people who want to simulate what energy trading would look like in their community. There's a couple places um, in, in the EU where this is becoming legal. Uh, Austria is one example in particular, um, where there's open regulation for people to trade energy um, in small groups or with their neighbors. 
So we are developing a, a version of our interface that allows these community managers to simulate their community, to invite the other community members, and to um, simulate how they can trade, how that would affect their energy bills, uh, basically as, um, as a proof of concept to their community members, and then as the next step to actually deploy this exchange in their community and to, to make it real. Um, yeah, so the way that we show this is it's uh, user-centric um, so that we explain and educate to consumers, you know, what are the benefits that they can get from this, what additional freedoms are they gaining in terms of their preferences and what they're able to do um, and what they're able to further understand about their energy use. Yes, and... Um, this kind of ties into to social media in a sense and how we plan to engage and grow. And um, yeah, our outreach uh, motivation is around making energy more social. And so we see this as a disruptive way to kind of break into the industry and to initiate this change, um, which is, you know, everyone has an online presence and to also connect this um, social presence that we have with our friends and family members online also in regards to energy. So you should be able to see your energy use online, um, invite other people you know to join your community, uh, also maybe educate other people in your community if you did some research to figure out, you know, the best PV to buy for your roof, could you, you know, write a blog post and share this information with other people um, to help grow the community and to grow the, um, the exchange and network that we have. So that's um, kind of where we're trying to go with this in the future. And one of our taglines is, you are energy, uh, to encourage people to think of themselves, their presence, their energy, and how that also relates to the energy they consume from the grid and how they see themselves um, in the energy space. Great. Um, yes, yeah, so this kind of this sums up the discussion here. Um, at the end of the day, you decide the future of energy. And so uh, at Grid Singularity, we, that's something we've been thinking about. What does the future of energy look like? How do we see ourselves as part of that? You know, what technology do people need in order to um, transition? And you know, how can everyday people become part of the transition uh, and to help enable it? Uh, rather than you know being dependent on the utility or, or other regulators that you know are, are telling them what to do, so we want to empower the consumer and we want to um, create energy exchanges that uh, allow us to accelerate to uh, accelerate to renewable energy uh, much faster. So yes, thank you. Well, whoa. <laughs> It was really good. I know there's at least one question in the room. We have time for two or three questions. I know there's some microphones that we can use. So, um, Mike, you have a question? It's not you, the guy next to you. You have a question? Do we have a mic here, please? Thank you. So, you can ask a question. We're going to put it out loud. Hello? Oh, uh, so I was wondering how are people going to pay for the energy? How is the auction model going to look like? And how will this all look like on the blockchain? Yes, Thank you. great. Thank you. Great question. Uh, yeah, so how we look at it is any energy asset that wants to trade, they place bids and offers into an open market. So uh, the bid is if they want to buy energy, you know, I want to buy one kilowatt hour of energy at 30 cents, something like this, or how much they want to sell for. Uh, so this is how, you know, what the interaction looks like. And then the actual um, 
matching of the trades is the clearing algorithm. There's many different clearing algorithms um, that you can use. Uh, we've looked at stuff like um, two-sided pay is bid, uh, pay is clear um, market algorithms. Uh, but we have also sort of uh, created this as a module so that um, another party could do the matching themselves. And so uh, they could do this in a decentralized way, actually, where they weave through maybe different nodes in the system that are creating bids and offers and uh, match those according to their algorithm, which is then uh, validated by uh, the exchange. And um, yeah, we're starting to build this structure on a substrate. Um, and uh, yes, it's basically incorporated as um, smart contracts and unfortunately the technical details of exactly how it's coded um, is not my specialty, but uh, one thing that is exciting about our company is all our code is open source. So you can uh, go to our GitHub and also contact us uh, if you want to know more about the actual uh, technical integration. Um, okay, hi. Um, so I have a question. Um, these people that are going to participate in the actual um, market um, have money, right? Because they have houses they, they invested in, um, in getting the, the energy, they thought about that. Um, this is more or less a new problem for, for them, right? So because they don't have that problem right now to participate in the grid to actually um, think about the energy. Um, so I'm thinking that they would actually want to simplify their life. What's the, what's the advantage? What are they getting out of this, right? Because I see that it's, it's uh, more or less competing with their uh, interests. They, I would want things to be simpler. Why, why go, why use a, a market for energy? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, so we want to shape our product so that it can be used by all different kinds of people. Um, also for people who maybe don't have smart meters or who have limited uh, energy assets. So we're trying to kind of carve out a use case for all of those. Um, I think in particular is probably more applicable for maybe energy enthusiasts and people who have um, already installed some of their own assets. And so an example may be if your community that has a PV installed, um, you can consume that energy, but the excess energy right now, you can sell it back to the utility, but there's a regulated rate. Like the, maybe they're only gonna buy it at five cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and you would like to, um, you know, and that doesn't matter. They're gonna pay you this no matter what the supply and demand on the market is. It's just a set price. Uh, but maybe the other neighborhood down the street, they don't have any solar energy, they would like to buy it from you. They're willing to pay more. It's still savings for them because it's actually less than what they would pay their utility. So what we're seeing is trying to facilitate more local energy trading, uh, which at the end of the day should be cheaper uh, because there's also grid fees, fees to use different portions of the grid. So if you consume energy more locally, then you would get a discount um, in your energy bill because you wouldn't be paying for the transmission grid, for example. So we see some use cases there uh, yeah, for people who have energy assets that they would ultimately be saving money at the end of the day. We have uh, time for one or two questions. Let's go to Alex. Uh, hello. So I was wondering, um, normally energy markets are usually very um, prone to uh, speculation, financial speculation. And um, there could be some people or entities who could uh, eventually be working the system. And don't get me wrong, I think speculation in, in a certain degree helps um, make markets more efficient. But um, in other cases, it could uh, strangle the, the markets that you're trying to build. So have you thought about uh, speculation and how the system could be worked to, to actually um, make for very unequal um, you know, ends? Yeah, yeah. I think it's something um, we probably should look into a little bit more. I think there needs to be rules preventing this. Um, a lot of the way we think about what we're doing is in very fast time spans, so people putting bids and offers for the next 15 minutes of consumption. Uh, and so if it's based off a weather forecast, then um, the, the data and the trades are really based off 
off real physical data. And I, yeah, I would be interested to look into maybe how speculation could occur, maybe if it's in futures energy trading, like if someone were to buy all the futures PV production or something and then want to sell it at a high price. And so how could we prevent people from, um, from basically like gambling on the future energy price? So I think there probably needs to be some, some regulations around that. Thank you. We have a question from Sebastian here in the front. If we can tap the mic, thanks. Hi, Sarah. Great presentation. And I think uh, what you're doing, what you're working on, is actually very, very important. So, congratulations. Quick question. You said you start, you're starting right now with a centralized system that's planning on becoming decentralized. Um, how are you planning on doing that if you start centralized? and? Are you building a parallel system that is decentralized or are you just planning on spinning it off or how, the, how, how will that work? Because I think decentralization, of course, is uh, yeah. most important in this field. So how are you planning on doing that? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're basically uh, building two parallel systems. So our um, first um, proof of concept was a centralized, it's written in Python, and now we have a decentralization team at our company that is basically transferring that code over to Substrate and other um, decentralized mechanisms. Um, one reason, I guess, frankly, that we have moved to decentralization faster is part of it was, you know, waiting for additional technology to come out from these uh, blockchain companies. And on the other side, you know, some people in the energy industry um, or communities, maybe they don't know about blockchain, and so that's not a requirement for them to deploy something. So, um, so yeah, we're working kind of on both in parallel. And one last question. I was expecting that. So, um, Sarah, what do you think are the prerequisites for a given country to make this possible? And maybe a follow-up question, how would you see a rollout over time? That's a very good question. Um, in terms of the prerequisites, yeah, we have done some internal studies on what the regulation is in different EU countries. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't the main person behind this, so I, I don't have it on the top of my head. Um, but I think um, there needs to be uh, probably more research done, more discussions with regulators, and um, basically opening the space. I think at the end of the day, it's, you know, if people, if peer-to-peer -peer trading is legal in a specific country, and if companies are allowed to create platforms to do this. I think that's the basic, um, the basic requirement uh, that has to happen there. And um, I think I forgot the second part of your question. Maybe. Oh, the rollout. Yeah, exactly. Um, right. And I think for that, we also have to target specific countries. Uh, we've been a very globally faced company. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, energy is different in different localities. So uh, as a company, we're trying to target specific countries to, uh, to start and to uh, look at those energy communities to run some pilot projects and then to roll out into uh, bigger projects. Uh, so hopefully this becomes more scalable once we have a proof of concept in a specific locality. You know, maybe we need to, um, you know, make sure that the software is written in the local language and uh, things like this, I think, are uh, especially important for the energy sector. Cool. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. Uh, let's give a big round of applause for Sarah. Thank you very much. <laughs>